come to critical illness insurance. What is critical illness insurance? Critical illness insurance is a kind of insurance policy. You are familiar probably if you have a car auto policy, you have uh, the rent, you have rental policy. This is a, a relatively new kind of policy. It pays a lump sum of money that's tax-free if you are diagnosed, okay, I've underlined the key words here, okay, 30 days after you are diagnosed with any one of the following illnesses, cancer, heart attack, stroke, these are the basic ones, okay, all the policies would cover this, all the basic policies would cover this, right, in addition to that, there are about 20 odd other illnesses that are covered, okay, if you are diagnosed with Alzheimer's, so benign brain, brain tumor, blindness, coma, find yourself in a coma, coronary bypass. Um, there's a gentleman, an advisor in Halifax in the year 2004 in the evening, he wasn't feeling well and as the evening progressed, you know, didn't get better. So the wife sent him to the IWK, emergency, IWK, is it IWK that you would go to emergency with him to recruit? So he went, his wife says, you know, after supper, go down, you know. And so he goes there, and um, true story, that, uh, his name is Corey Collins. And <coughs> he goes down to the IWK, and the, the doctor did some tests, and, sorry, to recruit. And the doctor did some tests, and he says to him, say your last goodbyes because you're not going to see the morning. <laughs> he said, what? You know, are you, are you, he said, no, he said, because your system is shutting down. He says, call who you need to call because he says you're not going to make it into the morning. Now, this guy is not very old, right? And so, of course, that's what he did. Called his wife, you know, whoever he could get in touch with. And true enough, by the morning, he was in a coma. And he was in a coma for four days. Okay? And Corey is a very funny guy. So he says at the end of uh, four days, you know, he says he got up and his wife was by his bedside. And he saw the chart, you know, the medical chart. So while she was still there, he pulled up, looked at the medical chart, and he saw the history. He says, you know, various times the wife failed, you know, she was still there, you know. So then the wife woke up. Then he thought, you know, he said to himself, he said, I thought this was a good time to ask her for, uh, to buy a Harley Davidson. <laughs> <laughs> Deafness, HIV infection, kidney failure on dialysis. Loss of limbs, loss of speech, severe burns, major organ transplant, waiting list, okay? I keep hearing all these, of these stories where, you know, somebody has something and then they put on a waiting list. I just want to go through the illnesses, Lou Gehrig, MS, paralysis, Parkinson's, aortic, whatever it is, surgery, anemia, meningitis, angioplasty, heart valve replacement. And then when it comes to cancer, they go into very specific kinds of cancer that they also cover, right? And then the loss of, of uh, dependence. So I thought perhaps the best way to, you know, personalize this to you was to do the following. In the last three years, or let's say five years, in the last five years, there's two, how many of us here? Okay. I'm just going to give me a name or a description of someone you know. Okay, if you know the first name, just give me the first name. If you don't know the first name, just say, tell me if it's a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker or something. What kind of illness, critical illness he or she has and how old that person was? I'll, I'll start the ball rolling. On Thursday, I was with my accountant, okay, and I, I have two companies. I have a, a holding company and a, an operating company, and they're doing the financial statements. And I was sitting down with him, and he, I was telling him, he was asking me how things were going, and I'm saying, you know, doing this workshop, I said, you know, I'm going to be talking about critical illness on Friday, and uh, he said, you know, funny you brought that up. He said, in the last three months, no, last three months, he said, okay, Three of my customers, three of my clients, he said, um, were told that they have six months to live, okay? And he said the oldest one was 53. He 
he's a chartered accountant. So he said, you know, the oldest one is 53, so I'm going to sit here, uh, customers. This particular one, um, I believe it was cancer. They were all different, but this one was cancer. He was 53 years old. But the reason why he brought that up was he says, it's interesting that you're going to be talking about critical illness insurance. He says, because three of my customers were told that by their doctor, by their doctors, and they got a second opinion, of course, in the just let's just talk about this one who was 53 year old, the oldest one. He said that he was told by his doctor that you've got cancer and you've got six months to live. So, you know, rearrange your affairs and whatnot. And of course, you know, it was not just it was not just his doctor, it was the specialist who told him that. The doctor identified it, went to the specialist. All right. My accountant said to me that this guy and all three of them went down to the States right, and through a program called Best Doctors because this business owner, he had a disability policy where he worked. And nowadays when you buy health insurance policy as a value add on, they give you access to Best, best Doctors. Best Doctors is, a, is an organization that if you are diagnosed with something and you, if you have access to Best Doctors, they will give you a second opinion and then they'll find the best of the best in the world in that, with that particular problem, right? So he said, because of my disability at work, um, I had access to best, best doctors and best doctors linked me to somebody in, in Texas, okay? And so when he was linked to, that, pers to that, that specialist in Texas, he sent all his docs down, right? And so the, the specialist told him that you have to fly down to Texas, I'd like to examine you myself, and he did. And when he went down to Texas, he had to take one or two or three trips, and you know, of course, there was money involved. He said the prognosis was there's no problem here, this is going to be fixed. Okay? And the other two were the same thing. They went down to the States, you know, and where they were told that they have six months here, it was fixed, right? I asked my accountant how much was he out of pocket for going down and all of that. He said about $60,000. So he had the means, right? What if he didn't have the means? Now I can tell you stories and stories because I collect these stories, but you know, it runs home the point, right? So here's my story. Does anybody have a story? Somebody that you know in the last five years who was affected by any of those illnesses, tell me the first name or you know, what kind of, you know, whether how you know that person and whether um, how old you think that person is for me. Maureen? Maureen, did she say? Okay. A colleague? Okay. And what did she have? Cancer? What kind of cancer? Are any? Breast cancer. Okay. And how old is she? 50. So let's say 55. So anybody else? In the last three to five years, Suzanne? Okay. Dad, okay, 65, it's tumor, right, brain tumor, okay, let's just stop there, no, we could, here, here's my point, okay, here's my point, that all of us, all of us, every one of us, okay, can look back three years, and we can name names, okay, we know of people who've been affected by the three, th the major ones, cancer, heart attack, stroke, and all of the others, right? So there is no discrimination, it's across the board, it's universal. The neighbor that Suzanne is referring to, she has cancer, her sister is in China, died recently, so younger than her, has cancer, China, okay? So, you know, it's across the board. So here's, here's the, the thing. So with that, um, let me move on here. Let me give some background as to where critical illness came about. It's a relatively new kind of insurance. 
born in Beaufort West, South Africa. The son of a missionary, he spent most of his childhood in one of the country's most deprived areas. Despite this modest upbringing, Can you start again so that we get the, all of the Dr. Marius Barnard, the creator of Critical Illness Insurance, was born in Beaufort West, South Africa. The son of a missionary, he spent most of his childhood in one of the country's most deprived areas. Despite this modest upbringing, his parents taught him and his brother Christian the benefits of knowledge. Both brothers went on to study medicine and became heart surgeons. On the 3rd of December 1967, he assisted his brother Christian in the first human-to-human -human heart transplant. And what's the patient's condition now? Pretty well. We are doctors and we try to save a human being's life. And, and I don't think there's anything special about it. As a doctor, I diagnose and treat patients. And as I went through medicine over the course of my 20, 30 years, I saw tremendous changes, not only in the medical needs, but also in the financial needs of those patients. <coughs> a case that really triggered my ideas was a young divorcee, 34, with two young children. The x-rays and biopsies confirmed the diagnosis of lung cancer, and we removed her lung. She went home five days later, and three weeks later, she was back at work. Two years approximately after the operation, she came to me at night in shaking room, basically dying on the seat, pale, exhausted, loss of weight, skin and bone, gasping for breath. And uh, I examined her, and it was pretty obvious that she was now in the terminal stages of cancer. Why did she still come to my room? You know, she can hardly walk. I, I can see her. She says, Doctor, I've come from work. Why was she at work? She needed the money. She needed money to provide for her children and herself rent, food, education. She died a few weeks later, and when she was buried, the life insurance policy paid out. Wouldn't it have been better for her to have the money when we diagnosed cancer? That poor little girl had to work until she basically was dead. This and many other cases like it made Marius realize there was a need for a new type of insurance, one that paid out on the diagnosis of illness, such as cancer, heart attack, and stroke. He shared his vision with an insurance company, which then went on to develop the first critical illness insurance policy. It's really a marriage between medicine and insurance. I would say we as doctors are the physical doctors. The protection insurance is the financial doctor. If you is ill, the first person you will go to would be to, if you have a heart attack, to your physical doctor. But I hope at that stage you already made provisions so that your financial health is in place. So that when you get physical buried, that you have financial protection to provide you with that money which is the promise of insurance and the definition of insurance, to give you money when you need it most. So it was started in, um, in it came about in Marius, uh, third, the first one was in South Africa in 1992. It came to North America in the mid-90s. Okay, so this is relatively new, but um, it's very relevant. Okay, because uh, you prior to that, you know, people you know, in, in terms of you just selling a life insurance, which is good for as a death benefit and for retirement purposes. But in between, what if you become disabled or critically ill along the way? And this addresses that. There's a, a company that prepared a video which I'm going to show you because I can speak to a lot of things, but because they took a lot of time and trouble to do this, I'm just going to write on its tail. Okay, I'm going to convey in the idea as much about it as I can because it's. happened so fast. One minute I was mowing the lawn and the next minute I was lying in a hospital bed. I, there were no symptoms, no warning. Don't worry about me. I'm coming along fine. 
just so glad I bought insurance to help me at a time like this so I can put my son's future at risk. The doc says I'm lucky. That could have been the big one. But if I'm careful, it's mostly a matter of time until I get better. A stroke, cancer, heart attack. They can be devastating, but we never think it will happen to us. According to the American Heart Association, nearly five and a half million Americans have survived a stroke, and many of them have to live with a permanent stroke-related disability. And 1,200,000 Americans are going to experience a heart attack within the next year. I didn't know what had happened. I... Well, in fact, all I did know was that I was in the hospital when they opened my eyes. And uh, Donna was there. She was on the street. And uh, my first thought was, oh, he's all right. But I couldn't see. Uh, the doctor told me I had suffered a stroke. The doctor said you were fortunate. You know, he could have died. But now, with enough care and therapy, things are beginning to get back to normal. When I got over feeling sorry for myself, and, uh, I began to think about money. Obviously, I, I wasn't able to earn an income. And nothing was coming in except the bills. Mortgage, utility bills, the credit cards. You know, they don't stop coming in. Just because I said. A few months before the stroke, um, Bob bought a critical illness insurance policy. I wasn't in favor of it. I mean, at the time, it was just another bill we had to pay. But Bob said, you never know. Now, I am so thankful that he had the foresight to buy a policy. It has really helped us at this time. All that was about 10 months ago. I'm now back in the office on a part-time basis and should be back to work full-time within the next few weeks. What happens from here, only time will tell. For Bob and Donna's family, the unimaginable became the imaginable, and their lives have been changed forever. Maria is a single mom with a teenage son. It should have been the best time of my life. I had fully recovered from my back surgery. I was pain-free and I had complete freedom of motion. And then, out of the clear blue, I discover a lump in my breast. Things were going really well at my new job, but because of my back surgery, I couldn't qualify for the disability program offered at work. So, I looked at the alternative. The company offered a chance for me to buy critical illness insurance through a payroll deduction, and I did. David, my son, He's getting ready for college. That was our dream. He finished his freshman year on the dean's list. But that summer, the doctor discovered the lump in my breast was malignant. Cancer. Mom would like to pretend that it was no big deal. She would always say, I've dealt with bigger odds before, and I can beat this. That was her line. She said that all the time. But she, she reacted really, really bad with chemo, so she couldn't work. Uh, she was really sick. So, you know, her, her medical expenses were pretty much covered for nothing else. So I, I wanted to be right by her mother. I told her that I was going to have to quit school and get a job. When he said that, it really hurt. I wanted David to have more than I ever had. I thought college was a sin. The critical illness policy I got at work, it really helped. It gave us money so that I could still help pay tuition and even have to leave school. The doctor says that mom is going to get better. But in the meantime, I'm just going to have to juggle school with my job. Um, you know, I'm, I will be a teacher. It's just going to take a little bit longer than I had expected. You know, and she will be able to see me through college and fulfill that dream. And it's, you know, it's just going to take a little bit longer. A dream deferred is better than a dream forgotten. College may be more than four years for David, but... He will graduate. With the money from the critical illness policy to help pay expenses, David and his mom were able to continue to realize their dream. Sam never thought this could happen, not to him. 
he's a careful man. I thought I was so smart. I always live within my means. Put in lots of overtime to pay for the kids' college so we wouldn't have any loans hanging over our heads after they graduate. Pay as you go, that was my motto. Our house was always one bedroom, too small. But it kept expenses down. Never got around to saving, but we were debt free and I had time. We always joke around about being worth more dead than alive. Well, I've got a lot of life insurance that takes care of me like that, don't I? But then a friend of mine asked me, what happens if you get sick and don't die? That's when I looked into that new critical illness. Sam's so easygoing. <laughs> Nothing bothers him. But when he had his heart attack, it felt like the bottom fell out of our world. It was bad. What little savings we had was gone in the first couple of weeks. Luckily, Sam's critical illness insurance helped pull us through. It's funny, isn't it? By the time I'm back on my feet, I'll be in my golden years. <laughs> right. Golden. Anita's a wonderful woman. She put up with me all her life. If that heart attack had killed me, she'd be looking at castles in France. But it didn't. So she's 52 and looking for a job. But it could be worse, you know. Because I bought critical illness insurance, it's going to be fine. Unfortunately, there's nothing that can prevent the unexpected or the unpredictable illness. But there is an insurance product to help ease the financial problems it leaves behind. Critical illness insurance from American General Life Insurance Company provides a lump sum benefit to help cover expenses when you're diagnosed with a heart attack, stroke, invasive cancer, or other covered conditions under the policy. The money is paid directly to you, so it can be used for direct costs, such as deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, and policy exclusions or paid for home health care that's above and beyond your current coverage, or for indirect costs, such as transportation, food, lodging, child care, lost income, or remodeling to make a home for the disabled accessible. Whatever your need might be, you can have an effective solution to help ease the financial burden and allow you to focus on what is important, getting well. Critical illness insurance from American General... All right, is that... This is, um, this is uh, the youth actress, Anita. So I just want to finish off with a real life story. Uh, this is of an agent who uh, walked into his office one day and you uh, are working for insurance companies. They provide you with a lot of educational material so that you, know, you uh, are able to be fit for, for others. He walked into his office and he watched a video on critical illness insurance and he was you know, so, uh, you know, so uh, inspired by it, he bought a policy not knowing that in a very short time he was going to walk through this water. So this is his story. So this is a real story. chemo treatment on Tuesday, but nothing was to stop me from coming here, because I have a passion now, a passion to inspire agents to sell and buy more coverage. So I'm here to tell you my story. Four years ago, I was probably in the best shape of my life. I was lifting weights, eating right. I developed a strange habit of playing basketball from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. three days a week with about 20 other idiots at the YMCA. Life was going perfect. I was not only in great shape, I was, my career was taking off, I was making more money than ever. I was spending a lot of time with my children, they were tuned for it for it. And I was doing well enough so my wife could be a stay-at-home mother, which she enjoyed. My life was perfect. In fact, my life had been perfect from the very beginning. As you just heard, my father's name was Gaylord Perry. And what that meant 
to me as a child, it meant that my childhood was just like a dream. From the time I could walk, I was on the field of major league stadiums, hanging out in the clubhouses with the guys, traveling all over the country with the team. Now, traveling around with 25 major leaguers is like traveling around with 25 large children. They don't have to grow up. They play a game for a living. It was just fantastic to be in that environment as a child. By the time I did retired when I was 16, I'd been to every stadium. I'd shag flies in Fenway Park. I'd take the bat and practice in Yankee Stadium. And I met all the greats. I have so many terrific memories. One of my first memories is being four or five years old in San Francisco. I remember sitting on my dad's knee in the clubhouse. That's right. My dad played in San Francisco for 10 years with the first name Gaylord. <laughs> Attendance was up when he pitched. He thought it was because it was, he was good, but it was because he was good looking. I remember sitting on my dad's knees having a bowl of ice cream because he had just won a game. That's how he celebrated. And I remember him telling me to go over to Willie Mays' locker. Willie Mays, who a lot of people consider to be the greatest player of all time. He told me to go up to his locker and grab his ice cream and bring it back to him. Now, the funny part of this story is about 15 years after that, I was reintroduced to Willie Mays. And my dad and I walked up to him. And my dad says, hey, Willie, remember little Jack? And I'll have to paraphrase what Mr. Mays said. He said, get the blank out of here. This little blanky blank is still my blank and ice cream. And uh, evidently he was still upset about the ice cream incident and uh, didn't like the fact that I was a foot taller than him. Now, I, I share with you my childhood and what my life was like four years ago to make you realize things didn't go wrong in my life. I had a charmed life. And there are probably some of you out here today that don't have a critical illness policy because you're that mindset that you're having a charmed life, life, and it can't, nothing can go wrong in your life. Well, I want those of you who don't have a policy to really listen to my story. I walked into my office one day, May of 2001, decided to watch a video about critical illness insurance. In that video, he was talking to a group like us, and he asked two questions. The first one was, who do you know who's had cancer, heart attack, stroke in the last five years? The people wrote down the names, the age of the diagnosis, what they're diagnosed with. And a few minutes later, they read that list. And it went something like this. One lady said, my sister had a heart attack at 32. Another one said, my neighbor had cancer at 40. Third one, my uh, uncle had a stroke at 45. Now, that caught my attention. I was 33 years old. I thought these things happened to people in their you know, 60s and 70s. So that caught my attention. And then he asked a question that changed my life. He said, who planned to be on that list? Who planned to be on that list? I realized at that moment that nobody plans to be on the list. Whether you're 33 years old, six foot eight, in great shape, no family history of anything, or if you're five foot eight, in terrible shape, and 58 years old, it doesn't matter. No one plans to be on that list. It's an aha moment for me. I stopped the video, filled out an application, had the physical on May 24th the flying color. Didn't think twice about it. I knew I was in great shape. It was a month later, I took my wife to the Bahamas for our anniversary. And it was there that I started noticing strange pain in my hips, my lower back, my ear. So being a typical male and being in the Bahamas, I just ordered a few Bahama Mamas down those, and the pain went away. So I self-medicated for the rest of the trip. Then I went home, and the pains would come back about once a week. I guess I was in denial. I was an athlete in college, and I had that mindset that I'd be okay. 
However, one Saturday morning, I woke up and I could barely walk, and my wife took me to the emergency room. They admitted me, and they ran about 10 tests. The last one was a bone marrow biopsy, where they take a skinny little corkscrew, stick it as small as your back, and pull out a sample of your bone marrow. Really quite pleasant. They sent me home, and the next day, August 1st, 68 days after my physical, my doctor called me and told me I had leukemia. Now, I remember what chair I was sitting in when I got the news, and I remember what my first thoughts were. My first thought was I can handle this. I was raised to be very positive. So I already had that attitude going, I can handle this. My second thought was my critical illness policy. My wife is a stay-at-home mother. My children are two and four. My most important job in the world is to take care of my family. How was I going to be able to do that? Even though I was doing pretty well in sales, just like most people in their early 30s, didn't have many save, much in savings. If I couldn't work for a year, how were we going to pay the mortgage? How was I going to handle the expenses? I finally got out of the hospital after about a month. And even though I was out of the hospital, my treatments didn't end. And it's very, very important as insurance people, as insurance agents, that we understand what treatments are like. I think of a lot of you, maybe a lot of people in general, think, well, if I have cancer, I'll be sick for a month or so, and I might miss two months of work. That's usually not the case, folks. The way my treatments went for the next six months was two weeks on, two weeks off. What that means is Monday morning, my wife drives me to the hospital. I get chemotherapy. It could be a shot. It could last five seconds. It could be three or four IV bags full of this stuff. It could last three or four hours. Monday afternoon, I go home. Monday night, no other way to put it. I start throwing up. Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon, I check into the hospital because I can't stop. Feel better by Friday, go home Friday. Monday, do the same thing for six months. The two weeks that you're off, you're so beat up from the two weeks you were on, you can't do anything. I didn't work a day. I could barely take care of myself some days. Well, that went on for six months, and then on February 24, 2002, I, I got what I thought was my last chemo treatment ever. And I remember as I'm throwing up, violently ill for maybe the 75th time or so, I kind of had a smile on my face. Because about three weeks later, I took my wife back to the Bahamas. And this time she drank the Bahama Mamas. And I took care of her. Now, how do you think that made me feel? Think about my wife, what my wife had been through. She didn't know if I was going to live or die. She's taking care of the kids, taking care of the house. She is stressed out. And I took her to the Bahamas, and she sat in the sand, and I sat in the sand. And I looked at the ocean, and I thought, Jack, you're a damn genius. The reason I thought that is because during one of my hospital stay, my wife walked into the room with tears in her eyes and gave me a check for $130,000. I was high on morphine at the time. And I looked at the check, and I thought it said $1.3 million. <laughs> I, uh, I was extremely happy for about five seconds. So I was able to take my wife to the Bahamas, and then over the next nine months or so, I took my family on four week long, each one. I didn't go back to work. I didn't need to go back to work. You know why? Had money in the bank. I worked about 15 hours a week. It was glorious. I thought I was making up for lost time, but unfortunately, I was creating memories that I would need for a difficult year ahead. Because right before Christmas, the pains returned in the back, in the ear. And I knew what it was before I went to the doctor. I knew it was the back. And when leukemia comes back a second time, they usually go for a stem cell transplant. 
Now, the closest hospital for stem cell transplant was in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, three hours away. How was I going to afford to pay my mortgage in Charlotte and pay for an apartment for my wife in Chapel Hill? How was I going to do that? I had money in the bank. I had money in the bank. So that's my story, is my ongoing story is being told by my head of a critical illness. I learned a lot. I learned a lot through this. I learned it, to trust in God. I learned to enjoy every day. Every day. Thank, thank God or be happy every day that you have good health. Don't take it for granted. And you know, I learned a lot about insurance. I thought I knew a lot about insurance. I learned a lot about what insurance is not as well. Insurance is not your commission. It's not shiny brochures. It's not numbers. It's not prices. Insurance is basically, as it's been said a lot of times today, is being there for your clients or yourself when you need it the most. After this Long illness. My wife is still a stay-at-home mother. We are still in our home. We still live in a neighborhood that my kids love. You know, I never had to make that dreaded list. That list of friends and family to call to ask for money. All right, so... Here are some statistics. Um, one in three people are going to be affected by cancer. One in four people are going to be affected by heart attack or heart disease. One in 20 will have a stroke. Okay? And these are just the, the, the biggies. Right? We've got 25 other illnesses that we, you know, they're there that just show up you know, as a, 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 you know, least expected. Right? So the odds are not in your favor. So please uh, get this for one of them. Any questions? Well, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I had my group insurance up to last year because my hours changed it, so they took me out of it. Where exactly, when you said you had to get an individual one, do you recommend any places where you can get it, or do I have to go to my company again and say I want to get my individual one? Um, the individual insurance you can get ma in many places, okay? Now, one of the, the things that we did when we approached uh, churches uh, to um, educate people, so that um, one of the reasons why they allowed us to come in here is because we said that we will not solicit business. Our, our role here is to educate you. But in saying that, we also wanted you to know that we do these things, okay? That's our bread and butter. You can come to us, you can go online, you, if you know of people who are financial advisors, you can deal with them. There's many sources that you can get this. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank okay. you. On that note, let's give the, bi the mic back to Austin. Let's just redo his question once more because I want to so ask the question again if I can. Okay. Um, my question was, if I had group insurance, um, does it cover uh, subsidy of the entire project? Rush, yes, it does, because it's minimal amount, okay? And then when later on, when we come to step number six, that's when we address it further. Again, just to reiterate, okay, group insurance, I we acknowledge it, because they will have to pay. But the only problem with group insurance is you have no control over it, okay? You leave the employment, you leave the insurance behind, okay? And even the employers don't have control over it in case you lose your job, okay? Because when you lose your job, guess what? You, you know, you've lost your income. You're not going to incur expenses. You're trying to, you know, keep your, you know, keep your expenses as low as possible. In as much as most group insurance policies allow you a conversion privilege to a private insurance, most people don't do it because that's not the time that they want to be, you know, choosing those plans. You follow? But if you do not have group insurance coverage, like in your case, get it. Okay. And uh, you know, like I said, through us or through online. Okay. There's many places you can go. And uh, you know, just to ask, ask around. Financially, there's a lot of your institutions where you do your banking. They all have, you know, right? Okay. Any other questions? Um, my question. 
question is what the um, the debt snowball. Right. Like, well, I know you're talking about the critical insurance, um, critical illness insurance, but would you recommend things like mass protection and loan? Or absolutely, absolutely. W when you um, before you get to step number six, right? One of the ways that if you do carry debt, every any time you carry debt, right, you want to make sure that it is insured for life and for critical illness and for disability. So that if you run out of time or if you run out of help, that loan is, that you don't live a mess for somebody else right, or for yourself, right? For now, okay? And then when you finish step number four and you come to step number six, then we will sit down and tweak it. You follow? Then we're gonna look at, you know, what's the best way to do this. So we will go out there and get a critical illness policy and we can get rid of them. Because chances are, the ones that you get through your creditor protection, you know, it's, you don't have control over it. It tends to be exorbitant in cost. Mm -hmm. You really have no, it's, it's a blanket coverage for all the, all the, the, the creditors. Do you follow? But when you get your own, then you, you can tailor and customize it to you. And if you're sitting with a financial advisor, we can do the shopping around for you. Make sure that, you know, it's really tweaked to you. All right? Any other questions? If you have no questions, I just want to close off with a few closing remarks, okay? Um, it is imperative, okay, that you have a financial goal, that you have a financial plan, and that you have a system to stay focused on the goal and on the plan, okay? This is like breathing, you know? Um, we don't, sometimes we take it for granted, but try to stop breathing. You know, you, it'll, it'll catch your attention very quickly. So similarly, uh, the managing of finances, uh, you know, we're not, we've got our, you know, we want to keep our perspective right, uh, you know, in the context, right, where it fits in the grand scheme of things, uh, but we do not want to neglect it, okay, because if it does, it can play havoc with your life, okay, in terms of the stresses that it will cause. The Bible says that, you know, poverty Poverty will come on you like a bandit, uh, like poverty and scarcity will come on you like a bandit and like an armed man, right, if you're not careful, right? And you know, bandits and armed men, when they come on you, they, they come, they don't announce it. They just show up, okay? And they catch you, you know, off guard, right? So in uh, Proverbs 6, 11, it says that, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit, and scarcity like an armed man. And then in Proverbs 24, verse 30, it says the same, uh, 34, it says the same thing. A little sleep, a little slumber, and poverty will come on you like a bandit, and scarcity like an armed man. All right, with that, I thank you so much for coming out. I know this is Saturday morning, I know this is summertime, I know you had choices for your time, but you took the time to come here, and I commend you for doing that, okay? Um, because this is extremely important. And I've designed it in a way that it's, it is the least encroachment upon your time, because I know you've got a life, you've got stuff that you want to do, all right? Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you on October the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 16th. October the 16th is our next session. Right, we, if you, um, there are feedback forms, give us your email address and we will make sure that you get one or two reminders um, from us. Uh, we also blanket it through the group, uh, the uh, young adult. And um, one of the ways that you can help us is uh, by being our advocate, okay? If you found value in what you've seen here, uh, in the course of the next 90 days, believe me, the talk of money and debt and financial insecurity comes up, like it or not, around the dinner table with your friends and whatnot. Make it a point to bring them, to bring them along, okay? And also, non-believers, because when they come into the house of the Lord, guess what? They just might bum into the Lord, right? They can rub shoulders with you, and you know, uh, we'll, we'll help plug the, 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 the financial gap but there are spiritual gaps these guys, people are walking around with a spir spiritual holes in the middle of their lives, right? Get a chance to rub shoulders with you. Thank you so much for coming in and have a great afternoon.